Hey, we want to take just a few moments to say thank you for choosing to worship with us here at One, whether it's in person or via our YouTube or podcast. Uh, I was asked just last week, what is one word that describes One? And I believe with all my heart that one word is family. And so my prayer, our prayer, is that you experience, whether it's in person or one of the many other avenues that you have to uh, experience worship with us, that you feel like a part of our family. Remember, go with God and you can't go wrong. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. It'll be on the screen if you don't have a Bible or a smartphone or app that you can open up and look at. Now, as I set the stage for this discipline, here, here it is. This is really exciting. I know you're going to get excited. You're going to ruin a single Pentecostal here. I'm going to talk to you about fasting this morning. Uh, I know, right? Super excited. Because some of you are already thinking about the gospel bird. You know what I'm saying? You're ready to eat some chicken. But just, just hang on, okay? I'm going to talk to you about fasting. I'm actually going to pull... As God has led me this week, a very different passage. I have never preached on fasting from this passage or these passages. I'll give a lot of cross-references. As you know, if you follow us on social media, I will try sometime this evening to put an outline up with those cross-references so that you can better see those. There was, there's so much. It's like, it's like subjects of the Bible. You really don't get a good grasp until you do a, a, a concord or you study and realize how much is said about that subject in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And there's a lot to be said about fasting. This morning, I, I want to talk to you primarily about how fasting is a choice. And you'll see that in just a moment. And I'm going to use the example that I see there out of the rich young ruler. Matthew captures this story. Mark captures this story. I just was already in Mark this week when I was uh, studying in, in my own life. And so we're just going to pick up on Mark's account of that. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. And Jesus was starting out... On his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, Why do you call me good? Jesus asked, Only God is truly good. Let me just say here that he's talking about the keeping of the Ten Commandments. You've got to kind of read between the lines and see what he says next. It's not that Jesus wasn't good. He was talking about that, that in, the, in the essence of what he's saying, they would keep all of the commandments, that he would be morally good, that he's saying God is the only true good. Verse 19, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and your mother. Verse 20, teacher, the man replied, I love this. I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. So this sets it in context that Jesus is not just going to be harsh and speak truth to him. Because the Bible teaches us to speak truth in love. And so he looks at him and he loves him and he loves him enough, just like you need people in your life like this, they love you enough to tell you the truth. You know what I mean? I don't need a bunch of people to pat me on the back. I need people, even though I don't like it, to tell me I talk too much or that I cut them off. I need people to tell me that. I need to be reminded, can I just stay here for a moment? I need to be reminded that my attitude stinks sometimes. Believe it or not, I know you think that I wear holy socks and I do mean that in the sense of God, not holes in them. But the reality is we need people to speak truth to us in love. And Jesus sets the example. He's moved with compassion, but he's about to absolutely thump him. And he, and he, and he looks at him, and he, and he has genuine love for him. Jesus says, there is still one thing you haven't done. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. 22 is crazy. 22 is crazy. This is, this is where some of you are saying, I give the largest gift this morning I've ever given. I want you to notice me so much more than money. This is where most of us find ourselves. At this, the man's face fell. His countenance was heavy. This man's face fell. And he went away sad, for he had many possessions. This 
story is often and Jesus would go on and he would turn to his disciples because he could probably see and he already knew the bewilderment of his disciples and if you read on in this chapter in Mark he he turns to him he says how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle you remember the story and the illustration because it's very very crazy sounding and they would understand uh, the the terminology in that moment and I want you to get this morning that I'm talking about fasting as a choice I want you to understand that this means so much more than just money. Now, in this context, he is, yes, talking about the best possessions that he has, but I want you to listen with your heart as God is reminding us that the spiritual disciplines in our lives, that one of the greatest tools, I believe, if not the most effective tool that we can have, is the gift and the opportunity to fast. I I, I heard Tony Evans tell this story. Anybody ever listen to Tony Evans preach? He's an African-American preacher. I mean, he's fantastic. Fantastic. He is probably the best illustrator of the Bible I've ever heard in my 40, nearly one years. He is fantastic. Fantastic. And he told this story, said it was based on a true story of these two lumberjacks. Now, th- th- that got my attention right away, as most of you know, that I- I'm pretty dangerous with a chainsaw. Okay? He told this story of these two lumberjacks. And one was an older lumberjack, the other was a younger lumberjack. And the younger lumberjack had gotten pretty good at chopping down trees within the 12 to 8 to 10 to whatever hour day they had. The old timer was still pretty good, but the young, the young guy, just like most of us do, he got a little bit of confidence. Uh, he got a little cocky, a little pride about him. And so he thought, well, I'm, I'm doing so well. I believe I will challenge the old timer to a contest. And so he tells him, he says, listen, I, I challenge you, I, I, I'm, I, I know I will cut down more trees in a work day than you. Young, he's got, he's got vim and, 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 he's, and he's got vitality and he's, he's, he's good, he thinks, he's, he thinks he knows everything. And, he, and, and so the old timer, he, he's still good himself? He says, sure. And so they go at it. They begin down to... Uh, uh, Tony Evans tells this story as I, I'm repeating it from listening to him. And, and they, get, they begin to chop down the trees and, 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 and men are working hard. And the young guy, as confident as he is already, he, he feels even more confident as he looks over. And every time the old timer would cut down a tree, he would notice that the old timer would take about a 15-minute break. And so he's feeling, man, he's, he's going at it even faster. He's like, I'm going to destroy him. I'm going to kick his tail. I'm going to show him that I'm so much better. And so at the end of the day, what is astonishing about the story, not to tell you the whole story, what was astonishing to me about the story, and I believe illustrates this this discipline of fasting, is that at the end of the day, what is crazy is that the old timer, even though he took 15-minute breaks, he cut down one-third more trees than the young guy. And so the young lumberjack, man, he is absolute, can you imagine, right? He is beside himself. Tony says he goes over to him and he says, I don't understand what doesn't make any sense. I looked over. You took a break after every tree. You sat over there. I've worked all day. I didn't take a break. I didn't stop. And the old timer smiles at him and he says to him, he says, yes, but what you did not know is that every time I was taking that break, I was sharpening my axe. And fasting in the life of a believer is sharpening the axe. For some of you, you are absolutely chopping away at the days. You are chasing what you believe is the destiny God has for you and, and that he set before you, and you are absolutely working yourself to the bone, but you are forgetting that sharpening is important to be more efficient in the ministry and in your life as you walk with Jesus. And I believe fasting is the file that will sharpen the two-edged sword, the word that we have that we can will and yield in our lives as a believer. And so I want you to understand as we set out to talk these three or four thoughts I have, that I, I, the discipline of fasting, if you're absolutely, absolutely wore out, if you're trying to do this thing called Christianity, if you're trying to do this thing called being like Jesus, if you're trying your best, you're giving, you're praying, you're reading, you're you're trying not to cuss and not to chew and not to go with girls that do, you're trying everything you know to do this, I promise you, the key ingredient that you're probably missing is the discipline of fasting that sharpens all those things, as we will see just as we look at the story of the rich young ruler. I want to give you four or five thoughts. Fasting, first of all, fasting is abstaining from food or other things, primarily food, 
to heighten my hunger for God. It's just that simple. It's I, 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 I will do less of this to have more of this. Do you understand? That's just as Mill Hill Yen as I can put it, that's neurology, right? Mudcat 101. It, it, it's just, I, I want less of this because I want more of this, okay? I won't be subject, as Paul would write in the church of Corinth, I won't be subject to the, to the God of my belly. Or media, or, 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 or social life, or popularity, uh, or social status. I won't be a slave to those things. I want less of those so I can have more of God. And the reason you don't have power and the reason you're not being efficient and doing it with a sense of excellence because you're not sharpening the acts, the Holy Spirit that lives inside you. And so you need to understand that there's some things we abstain. It's a spiritual discipline. And I promise you, it is a discipline. And so when we talk about fasting, I'll give you these aspects and I'll do them very quickly. Fasting, first of all, is expected. Fasting is expected. Jesus expects us to do without some things to gain more of him. I'll give you an example, and the reason I say that fasting, Matthew 6, 16, part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says this, and I'm just going to quote him, and I'll put this up later. I'm just going to quote Jesus, and I'm just going to give you about four words. And when you fast, key word, when. And when you do without some worldly things to want more of me. Like skipping the lunch break, and instead of sharpening the belly, you sharpen your walk with the Lord. Do you understand? And so it's, it's not that he commands it, because see, his love is not a forced love. That's what we have deemed rape, and that is illegal. He wants you to choose to love him, and so he, he just expects you to fast, just like he did in this same context, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. He expects you, watch this, he expects you to pray and he expects you to give. He also expects you to fast. It was just a normal part, a normal part of the Christian's life. Not in the 21st century anymore. That's why it's so big and so popular for, for corporate fasting, which is biblical. It makes such headlines that people have written books. And I, there's a great books. And Jensen Franklin, his church, I think, have really set the course for those in the 21-day fast and the Daniel fast and the partial fast and the, the absolute fast and, and the media fast and the, all those things. But it's, again, abstaining from those things, and it's expected of us. It's expected that we would discipline ourselves enough to pull away from the things of the world and want more of God. Secondly, I believe fasting is a choice. Now, this is the crux of the message. This is what the beginning of my talk and the end of my talk, this is what it all pivots on. This is why... Uh, when I read the story of the rich young ruler, it reminded me of fasting. Because I don't know about you, I love to eat. I just do. I'm telling you, the last couple of weeks, it's been, it's been the most difficult thing to stay strict. Not to a diet. I don't believe in dieting, but I believe in a lifestyle. It's been very difficult for me to stay in a lifestyle of very little sugar. You know why? Because my wonderful, awesome father-in-law... And because he doesn't audibly talk a lot, not that he can't speak or that he's ignorant and can't speak, but his love language is to give stuff. And so my wife can go down to home, which is Nuri, and she can come back. And so with the girls, they've normally got a bag or two or three full of just stuff, be it from gum to Gatorade. I mean, it's just random stuff. But just a couple weeks ago, Sandra comes in from George's house with this ginormous gallon jug of cookies and cream ice cream. And I can promise you, I can promise you, Lana has about ate it all. It's just difficult. And so I want you to understand that he expects it, but it's also a choice. I have a choice, and I promise you it is a discipline. And, and we see that just as we look at the rich young ruler. Just like him, we have a choice. Jesus says, and I hope this makes sense and why I, 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 I used him as my platform. The rich young ruler, he, the ruler, he comes running up, and he calls him good, and, and Jesus corrects him and says, why do you call me good? And so he, he goes on even further. He's desperate at this point because Jesus is leaving and he had heard about all that Jesus could do. And maybe you find yourself there. You're desperate and it's okay to come to a place of desperation. That's most of the time when you have your breakthrough. And he's looking for this major breakthrough. I don't know what it doesn't tell us that, but he falls before God. And there's a difference between seating in prayer, standing in prayer, kneeling in prayer, 
or falling on your face in prayer. That's, I'm telling you, when you fall on your face, prostrate is the Bible calls it. When you fall out, man, you are desperate. He hits his knees, so he's desperate. And he, and, 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 and he says, I've done all these things because Jesus says, what about these commandments? And he knows his heart, so he's setting them up. And he says, well, I've done all these things. And the guy says, I've done all those things. And Jesus says, but this one thing you have not done. Go get all your stuff, sell it, and give to the poor. And in that instant, a decision had to be made. And this guy, instead of choosing God, he chose self. Because it says his countenance fell, he looked sad, he, he was defeated, he went away just kicking the rocks, so well. Because he said he had many possessions. He's rich. And so when we look at the discipline of fasting, I want you to get he expects it, but he also says fasting is a choice and you have a choice. And watch this, you can choose between the physical or the spiritual. You can choose not only between the physical and the spiritual, you can choose between comfort or sacrifice. You can choose between comfort and sacrifice, and ultimately you can choose between religion and relationship. And what this guy was doing, he was choosing his comfort, he was choosing his physical and he was choosing his religion because he said, I'm, I'm doing all these things. I'm giving. I'm serving. I, and listen, I don't care how large our church gets numerically. What I'm looking for is a church that is authentic. Amen. That's just real. Don't mind just telling it like it is and that we're honest and that this is where we are. And if we will get real honest this morning, most of us choose our belly over our sacrifice in the Lord. Most of us choose our comfort over our sacrifice for the Lord. Most of us choose the physical over the spiritual. Why? Because we've been born and bred in this me generation. This, this is all about me and that I, if I can't see it, I can't believe in it. And so we choose the seen over the unseen. And the Lord tells us, as he inspires the writer of Hebrew, that we walk by faith and not by sight. This is the crux of what we do when we fast. We say, God, I choose not all this stuff. I choose you. Fasting's a choice. And so if you're, if you're in a drought, if you're desperate, if there's a huge decision, if there's a kid that's wayward, if there's a decision or a sickness, do you understand what I'm saying to you? He expects us to fast, but you need to choose God instead of choosing your belly and the pleasures of this world. And so fasting is a choice. And the rich young ruler, he chose his belly over God. And here's what's crazy. You're listening, say amen. I know this is not one of them happy, clappy, and let's walk on water kind of stuff, but I promise you this is the key to walking on water. This is where we find ourselves and the reason we don't fast. The reason we don't pull away from the news, the reason we don't pull away from the TV, the reason we pull away, it's the reason we check our Facebook first thing instead of reading our Bible or praying. It's the reason we check our Instagram, our Snapchat. You understand, it's the reason we'll pull up to a big bucket of fried chicken. You get it, right? You're with me, right? And none of us, let me tell you something, none of you, none of you have really, really experienced hunger. Food in America is readily available even in the convenience store now. I don't know what that stuff's made over there rotating on that little wheel. It don't look natural to me. So none of us really know what it's like to be hungry. And so is the church in the 21st century. They're not hungry anymore for the move of God and the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. They're not hungry to see the breakthroughs. They're not hungry to see the dead raised. They're not hungry to see people walk on water. They're not hungry to see revival. They're not hungry to see the next little steel building built so that more people can come to know Jesus Christ. They're all about themselves and their comforts. That's where we see that in that rich young ruler. He was choosing himself over. I know that you want to say amen. I know it makes you happy to be reminded of that. As God has whooped me all week as I deliver this message, I've been so in a sulking manner, pouting, making mountains out of molehills as God rests my mama's soul. That's all I've done this week. You ever had those weeks where it seemed like everything you put your hand to, it just turned to poo? And do I need to break down what poo means? I kid you not, and I mean this with all due respect, I literally, I've never in 18, almost 20 years, Vinny, I've never, I, I'm telling you, this is how challenging this week was for me. I 
I've never walked into a place and not be prepared when it comes to ministerial. And I'm t- I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest because we're family, right? Is it okay? And I'm choosing to be, be transparent and, and hopefully will help you as it helps me to just, this is good, this is good therapy for me. I, I don't pay a counselor, okay? And I don't take medicine. Well, I take medicine for ADD, but you understand. That's a necessity, right? Amen. Some of you are saying, can I know the doctor so I can get him to up your dosage? <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just felt inadequate. And, and I felt like quitting. And I, 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 I go through these seasons, right? It's, it's not new to me. But this week, it seemed like every single day. And I'm trying to do right. I, I'm trying. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to people. I'm praying for people. I, I'm, 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 I'm giving. I'm, 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 I'm working. I'm, 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 I'm checking my phone even when I do work. I'm, I'm meeting people late. I, I, I do, I'm doing all these things. And it seemed like everything I put my hand to, everything I put my hand to, it just turned to poo or made somebody mad or somebody felt like they needed to let me know how they felt. And so you get in this pity party. This is, this is the choice you make. This is where we lack. And all I could think about was my comfort. All I could think about was, listen, I would, please, please, please don't quit me. The people need you here, okay? This community needs this body of believers and your unique weirdness, okay? I was so selfish. I was so selfish this week and so, so twisted and so concerned and letting the belly be the God that I, was, I, I, had, I had got this way. How come nobody asked me, how am I doing? I'd like somebody to inbox me and say, hey, can I pay your power bill this month? Because don't think for a second, it ain't tough. On a teacher's salary and $500 a week as a preacher and a few hundred that I'm blessed. And listen, I'm blessed. I'm blessed because I've, I've watched him take that little bit of money. And we travel on that money. We buy clothes for our kids. We put food in their belly. But you, you understand, you ever get that way? You ever get in that pity party? And so wish somebody just say, hey, can I do this for you? Don't you think that your pastor is immune to that stuff? And don't you think I need you all afternoon to send me messages and say I love you? Now, if you want to pay my power bill, I'll let you pay my power bill. <laughs> I'm just keeping it real with you. And I got this message churning in my heart, churning in my heart, churning in my heart, churning in my heart. Don't think of yourself. Sacrifice yourself. Be a poured out drink offering at the end of the day. God has called you to do something greater than yourself. And fasting is the tool, it's the discipline that sharpens that axe, that reminds you when you pull away from the junk of this world. And I was so excited because even though it's NFL and it's preseason and preseason sucks and NFL I can't stand because I really like college football, it was still football this week, man. And I was excited. I was just going to watch football. I couldn't even watch football. I'm, I'm at an age now that I'm, I'm watching these kids go from college to play pro and I'm trying to find them and keep up with them because I love football. Have I told you lately? I love peewee football, flag football. I like rugby. I like rug- I'm more, the older I get, the better I like rugby. I should have played that. I'd like to hurt somebody. <laughs> and, uh, I met a chick uh, a couple weeks ago. She plays for college up north. I didn't know that they had women's rugby league. I wouldn't mess with her. I couldn't even watch that. I could, I could not watch that. I, I, I had to study. I had to understand what is going on. Why am I like this? What is it? And God said, just choose me. I've blessed you. And God's honored. And God's honored. God's honored. I've watched God, I've watched God absolutely do amazing things. In the same week, that's just everything I put my hand to seemed to turn to poo. And again, I don't need you to, I don't need you to text me. I don't need you to call me. I will, it's not, I'm not fishing for that. I'm not doing anything like that at all. But I know if it is in my life, it is in your life. And you would never think because Satan will absolutely try to keep you away from the greatest tool that you have in your toolbox, and that is fasting. That is saying, I will not watch this. I will not eat that. Primarily, it deals with food. I will abstain from this meal so that I can pray and think and meditate on what God is doing. And you can't do it because you say, I want to lose weight and it's good for my health. It is and you will, but not in the spiritual realm. It's saying, God, I don't want this. I want more of you. And if you're trying to break me down to teach me something, then God, break me down to teach me so that when I'm taught, I can teach others. 
Fasting is expected. Fasting is a choice. Watch this. And I've alluded to this. We'll go right into it very quickly. Fasting also is revealing. See, this rich young ruler, as he come and he wouldn't abstain from his stuff, we ultimately see that he, he, wouldn't, he, he would rather have his comfort and, 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 and his pleasures and his worldly things and what he could see than to trust the unseen and forsake everything and have dirty shoes, dirty sandals, dirty feet, and not know where the food's coming from and not even have it. Because Jesus said, listen, I don't even have, Son of God don't even have where to lay his head. Even his birth into the world, there was no room for him in the end. Do you forget the Christmas story? Do you think it's just about Charlie Brown and his little tree? When you come to Jesus, I want you to understand, and I've watched people do this, and it just absolutely infuriates me. That's why I get so mad at myself, is they get this and they say, well, until I started trying to do right, all held him. But what do you think's going to happen? Jesus said, my way is not the way of this world. When you come to Jesus, you're going to absolutely go against the grain, and you're going to be swimming upstream, and I'm telling you all hell's going to break loose. If I've been known for anything in my 20 years of pastoring, it is being that I've tried to talk people out of being saved. You say, what? Because listen, you don't really want this. This life is the ultimate life. It is the life of joy and peace and courage and faithfulness and amazing moments. But it is one that you will carry your cross. You will bury people. You will see tragedy hit. You will not understand stuff. And yet you still have to put one foot in front of the other and walk by faith. And the key to unlocking the power to do all that is fasting. It's fasting. It's saying, God, I want more of you. I need more of you. I, I, I'm confused. I need direction. I need to understand this. I, God, and so I say, I'm going to discipline my body. I'm going to buffet my body, as the King James say. I'll say, God, I want more of you. And so we bring ourselves. And when we do that, it is very revealing. Fasting reveals what ultimately truly controls your life. Because the moment you try to start living for Jesus is the moment everything that really had been controlling your life will rear its head and go, Come on back over here. I mean, the boy's going out Friday night. Hey, it's happy hour over here at this time. Because they got, it's all you can eat chicken wings, man. Woo! I love me some chicken wings, but I'm hungry. I'm sorry. I'm talking about fasting. Anyway. <laughs> fasting reveals the reason we do not fast and abstain from things is because it reveals what really controls our lives. You're listening to me? I dare you to try not to pick your smartphone up. For a whole hour. For some of you, I can say five minutes. In five minutes, some of you teenage, some of you adults, you'd be, you'd be, you'd be fiending, boy. Like the guy that hadn't had a snort in a while or a drink in a while. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not making a lot of either one of those things because I've, I've walked that journey out myself. Fasting and pulling away from the things of this world really absolutely reveals what controls our life. Most of us are controlled by the appetite of our belly and not the appetite of our heart. Fasting reveals not only what really ultimately controls us, but fasting will reveal what we really genuinely care about. And if you think I'm making it up, I will give you another verse of Scripture said by Jesus himself being he is the Mac Daddy and the authority of it all, he said this as he pulled up in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, he said this, God bless you that hunger and thirst for justice. Or if you're a King James only kind of person, blessed is he that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Has some pretty good sting to it. I like that too. Fasting reveals what ultimately controls our life, but fasting and pulling away from the things of this world ultimately reveals what we care about most. And if we're not careful, you listening to me? I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this as easy as I can. If we're not careful, we'll put our friends and our family above God. I read this incredible article this week that said, you need a time to fast from people. It was the best article I've ever read because I'm an introvert and a loner, and that's just how I will be a, 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 a rambler all my days, as they would sing. God didn't make us that way. He made us a relationship, but we struggle with that. I'm telling you, fasting from people. 
there, there, is a time, there is a time that we have to be careful that we don't put our family over God. And remember when they come to him and they said, Jesus, your brother and your sister, trying to get, he goes, well, brother, my, he goes, who do you think? My mother and my brother, who do you think they, who? he goes, look out there. That's my mother and that's my brother. And he would also remind us that, that our love for him Remember, it's revealing, fasting is revealing what we really, really care. I know this is one of those really happy, clappy ones. He said that when you compare your love and pursuit of him, it should look like you hate your own children, your own mother, your own spouse, your family. Do you understand? That is pretty, pretty serious. Fasting Abstaining from things of this world reveals what controls us. It reveals what we ultimately care about. And let me give you this last one so we can end kind of on a higher note. You still with me, right? Say amen. amen. Fasting is expected. He doesn't, he doesn't necessarily command it and say, you must fast. He just expects it to be a part of the normal Christian walk. Fasting, fa I'm telling you, fasting is a choice. It's choosing between things of this world, the appetite of our belly, over and pleasure over God himself. Fasting also reveals, it reveals what really controls our life. If you can't go a moment without something, that's your God. Whether it be cigarettes, alcohol, tobacco, pornography, drugs, fried chicken, oh God forgive me. Cookies and cream, ice cream. I love that stuff. Mwah! I do. But ultimately, listen to me. Listen to me. Fasting is rewarding. It's rewarding. And, 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 and I, I, I want to share with you, and I want to touch, I want to I use a, you see, what the, what, the, what the rich young ruler didn't know, he thought all this stuff, he didn't know that what God had in store for him it far outweighed all of the stuff. See, what we do sometimes in choosing the world and our comfort and our pleasures and our belly over wanting more of God is that we're saying, we're saying God, I really don't care what you've got for me. And what we, what we fail and what we, 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 we are so struggling with is to see the good that God has for us. He has such good for us. He wants the reward. Let, let, me, let me go back and, and read you in, in context what Jesus said about fasting in Matthew. Matthew 6, 16 through 18. And when you fast, I, I give you that a little bit earlier, right? And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and, and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. It's not religion, it's a relationship. I'll tell you the truth, that the, the only reward they will ever get is the stuff you have right now. Somebody sent me a picture here a while back. I think it was Gina Hilger, as a matter of fact. She sent me a picture of a hearse pulling a U-Haul. I've never seen a hearse pull a U-Haul, and I've never seen a hearse have a uh, luggage rack on top because you can't take the stuff with you. But obviously, these folks are going to be buried with their stuff, I guess. I don't know. They had a U-Haul behind them. I'm telling you, you won't take it with you. You won't. Your kids will probably fight over it. I'm just being real with you. And he says, listen, all the rewards you get is right now. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Put a breath mint in so that you don't knock people down with your stank breath. That's just what he's saying, really. Because when you go without, I'm telling you, you get all dry, cotton mouth, you know what I'm saying? Whew, God bless you. God bless you. I'm like, amen. Amen. I'm trying, okay? Watch this. Verse 18, chapter 6. Wash your face, come here, 17. But no one will notice that you are fasting except your father. This is what I want you to listen to me, okay? All seriousness. No one will notice except your father who knows what you do in private. Now, that can be very scary or it can be very liberating. That God sees everything. He knows what you look at on your phone. He knows what you're reading. He knows what you're looking at on your computer. He knows where you're going. He knows what you're drinking. He knows what you're doing. You understand? It's okay. He says he knows everything you do in private. And your Father who sees everything will reward you in the open. Fasting is rewarding. Pulling away from the things of this world, saying, God, I want more of you. 
is very, very rewarding. The word rewarding means to repay, to give back, or to make a return. This is what the young rich ruler is. This is what we choose and miss when we don't abstain from the things of the world. And I'm not trying to say don't go here, don't do that. It could be anything in your life that God is saying. You, can't, you, you, you know that that's your God right now, and you need to give that up. It's a multitude of things for a multitude of people, but it's saying, God, I want more of you. And he knows that, and he says, if you will do that, I will absolutely give you back more and better than you will ever, ever think, dream, or imagine. Let me tell you what fasting does, and this is how I'll conclude this morning's lesson together. Fasting, fasting, it's rewarding because it ignites our hunger for God. It just ignites our hunger for God. The, The more I realize that I don't need this stuff, And this stuff could be anything, this stuff, to bring me pleasure and to bring me confirmation and to make me feel more manly. When I realize that really it's just God and God alone, and sometimes, and sometimes it saddens me that people have to be told they've got three months to live before they realize, listen, God is all I will ever really need. You understand? Why in the world, as I've listened to Bruce tell us that, why in the world would you wait to that moment? Because some of you won't have that chance. You will absolutely, you listening to me? You will absolutely, as I said about AJ, live your life, pedal to the metal for God. I'm telling you, you have no idea when it is the absolute last moment you have. And so when you fast, when you pull away from stuff of this world, it just ignites, it ignites your hunger for God. It just absolutely says, I want more of God because I realize I don't need this stuff, the stuff that's causing me stress, the stuff that that's causing me heart attacks, the stuff that's wearing me down, the stuff that absolutely is driving me crazy. I don't really need that. God said, I'll fight the fight for you. Just want more of me. So it ignites that hunger. And then lastly, that reward is that, watch this, I love this. It invokes, it invokes the power of God. Jesus had gone on the mountain to pray. And he comes back down, and and while he was up there, his disciples encountered a demon-possessed person. And they did everything they could. They'd watched their master, and though they didn't understand, they did everything they could to cast that demon out, and yet they could not do it. Just like some of you, you're chopping and chopping and chopping, but your axe is dull. They're doing everything they could, and watch this. And then Jesus comes down, and he goes, demon be gone, and the demon was gone. And they said, listen, master, Jesus, teacher, Rabbi, how do we do that? Jesus says, this kind does not go out except by prayer and guess what? Fasting. Some translations lead this verse off, this little phrase all. Some actually do it a better justice by translating it even closer when it says whatever mountain it is. When you fast, when you say, God, I want more of you and less of the world, when you discipline yourself to say, God, I want more of you, it invokes, listen, I promise you, go back to the Old Testament, read Zechariah, read read plenty of places. I'm telling you, when you choose the supernatural over the natural, it gets God's attention. When you choose to sacrifice instead of have your comfort, it gets God's attention. When you choose to say, God, not my will, but your will, I'm telling you, it gets God's attention. I've been very clear in my years and my theology is based on the word of God. I do not believe that the victory was won at the cross. I do not believe the victory was won at the resurrection. I believe the victory was won when Jesus said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. In that moment, he said, not my pleasure, not my comfort. And it evoked the power of God to give him grace through the cross and the struggles of life. And it gave him the power and the grace to bring life to what which was dead. And you may be there right now, and I'm telling you, that that sharpens the axe is fasting. It's saying, God, I choose you. I want more of you. You say, God, I want more of you. It absolutely gets his attention. So I don't know what mountain you're facing. I don't know what demon has a hold of you. But I'm telling you, I know the power to overcome all things through Christ that strengthened me. I know and I have seen firsthand that God is honored in sacrifice. He tells us if we will humble ourselves before man, 
He will exalt us. I don't know what it is. I don't know where you're struggling. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know your doubts. I don't know your fears. I know my doubts and I know my fears and I know my pity parties and I'll throw them very well. We even have Cool Ranch Doritos at my pity parties. I do it right. I'm not walking the same journey as you will. We're journeying together. It is your walk. It is your life. I promise you, though, that Christ is the answer. I promise you the reason you're struggling as a Christian is, is I promise you the key that will unlock that, that will move that mountain, that will remove those doubts, that will remove that heaviness. I promise you it's not just prayer. It's not just faithful. It's not just obeying the commandments. It is saying, God, I abstain from this. I hunger more for you than the things of this world. I am at a place at nearly 41 years of age. I could care less what they think about me. I will no longer be driven by the fear and expectation of man. I will no longer be threatened by idle threats. For my God is my refuge. He is my stronghold. He is my shield. He is the buckler. He is absolutely the alpha and the omega. He will start it and bless God. He will finish it. My job is to seek Him diligently. And to pray fervently. So I don't know what it is in your life, but the key is desiring Him more than any other thing this side. Will you stand, please? Father, we love you. We thank you this morning. Thank you for your awesome word. I thank you for my family. I pray, God, that whatever demon, whatever mountain is in their way, whatever obstacle they're facing, that they will realize nothing is impossible with you. That you have given us the keys. You said you leave all authority unto us. We just have to use them. So I pray, God, for spiritual revival. I pray for sharp axes. I pray for lighter burdens. The burdens are always going to be there. The pain is always present, but you give us grace to endure and power to overcome. And I pray that same power is received here this morning. In Jesus' name, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you don't know Christ, it's very, 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 very important. You are not promised tomorrow. It is very important. It is very important that you say yes to Jesus Christ. Not to this church, not to this denomination, not to me, but you say yes to Jesus. For there is no other name given amongst men where you shall be saved. And so you say, what do I say? How do I get saved? How do I make sure that I inherit eternal life? You confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart. That Jesus Christ was the Son of God. That he lived a sinless life, born of a virgin, died on Calvary's cross. And on the third day, he arose from the tomb, taking with him the keys to death, hell, and the grave. The same power that brought him back to life. The same power that resurrected. That same power is the power of the Holy Ghost that he sent back at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. That will absolutely, absolutely resurrect your life right now. And all you got to do is say yes. So if you need Christ, I want you to pray something like this. Jesus, save me. I turn from the way I'm living, which is to repent. That's a churchy word. But it just means to turn, to, to not be perfect, but to do all you can to live according to his word. It is Christ's life in you, the hope of glory. So Jesus saved me. I turn from the way I'm living. I embrace you, even though I don't understand it all. I believe you died for me and that you arose from the tomb for me. In life right now, you give.